We are live. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an annual pleasure. I wish it were more often, actually, to talk <laughs> to Jonathan Kellerman, who is home residing um, in his beautiful room, which I'm happy to say I've been able to visit. Uh, it's a gorgeous house. Has some really cool cars parked outside. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Lots of good stuff. Yeah. And we're here to talk about a natural history. And John, since you're the only person with an actual book, could you hold it up so we can all admire it? <laughs> There it there is. Hooray. <laughs> so this is, I think, the 29th, 30, 39th, 39th Alex Delaware novel, which has been a work in progress since, did you say 1985, John? Yeah, yeah. So clearly, if not the longest running, certainly among the longest running yeah. crime series by a still living author. <laughs> which is, so far. <laughs> which is a really good thing. So let me just, I, because I had to read this as a printout of a, of a manuscript, um, I, got, I got an actual biography of John, so I'm going to call from it slightly. But let me start by just showing you this awesome list of all of the books that John has written. The Delawares are at the top. I know you can't read it, but you can just kind of see the real estate. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Brings back because, memories. Right. And he and Jesse, his son, together have written six so far, and one is scheduled so far for August um, of this year. I, it's actually a year from from summer. Oh, it's so been, they, it's, it's not 2024? Up. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I only get to talk to John on Zoom with you once this year. Bummer. You can talk anytime. We well, don't need a book to talk. No, we absolutely do not. But he's written numerous other novels, graphic novels, novels with his wife, Faye, et cetera. So Jonathan Kellerman is the number one New York Times bestselling author of 52, according to this, crime novels. Um, and in, in addition to Alex Delaware, The Butcher's Theater, Billy Strait, The Conspiracy, Conspiracy Club, Twisted True Detectives, and The Murderer's Daughter, which I might say is a book I really liked, Thank and you. I wish that I'd seen more of it. With his wife, best-selling novelist Faye Kellerman, he co-authored Double Homicide and Capital Crime, and then we've mentioned he and Jesse together have written six novels so far, one to come in August of 2024. Um, he's also written about his amazing guitar collection, which has like, an entire house of its own. <laughs> at John's it house in which, oh, God. I mean, it is magical to visit John's guitars. He's won the Goldman, Edgar, and Anthony Awards and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Psychological Association, because let's not forget that before John started writing books, he was, and to some degree, I guess, remains a practicing psychologist. Um, and he's been nominated for a Seamus Award. I don't know why they tuck that in at the end, for heaven's sake. Why didn't they <laughs> that up? She goes her best private eye novel. No, the, you um, know what happened with that Seamus? They nominated me and I was supposed to win, actually. And then someone said Delaware is not a private eye. So they disqualified me mid contest. You're kidding. Nope. It, that's not really true because I thought it extended past private eyes to people like Alex who in a yeah. capacity investigate and work with law enforcement maybe in those days they were stricter i mean I, it what are you going to do <laughs> so. not much i guess all the interesting <laughs> changed my life hasn't <laughs> changed my life a whit stripped from our stripped from our award before I, actually I, winning it. i'm kind of used to that actually because when i was in in middle school we had a thing called a bible contest yeah and i and i won I was like 12, 11, 12 years old, and I won. I went to national, and then I entered the following year, and then parents started to complain that I kept winning, so they disqualified me and passed the post facto law saying you couldn't, you couldn't enter once you'd won. <laughs> so I'm used to this. This has happened to me before. <laughs> I love it. All right, so when we're going to talk about a natural history, one of the first things I will mention, and we'll come back to it, is that Los Angeles is always a character in John's novels. And in this one, he has a particularly interesting section, I think, about Culver City, which we'll get to. But I want to approach this in sort of more um, in a different order. Um, every, every really great crime novel needs a great villain. But in this one, we have a particularly elusive villain, a villain that I don't think we ever really get to grips with, John. Um, did you do that on purpose? I mean, that's the character of Victor Clement, is that nobody actually, is it Victor or Vincent? Well, Sorry. well he's not really the bad guy. He's, it's, it's no, another he's guy. It's another guy. guy I don't want to name because 
you know, I'm one of those guys. There, there are many ways to write a crime novel. And some novels, like my, by my good friend, John, John Camp, known as John Sanford. I think he's great. And he's able to write those books where you know who the bad guy is and still full of suspense. I, I write a whodunit. And right. I really don't want people to know until the end. And so far, no one's been able to guess. And I try to play fair. So, you know. No, I think you do. Um, but what I the reason I brought him up was that he's most of the time you do kind of know he's he's not not necessarily the villain, but everything stems from him and his life and his life oh, choices. For sure. For sure. And and he remains this elusive and unknowable figure. Um, and I thought it was interesting that you did that because well, a lot of the time we do actually finally get to know who I, somebody is. But he's really kind of, I hate to use the term of red herring. He's really, we think he's the thing because he has spawned this bizarre family. And most of my books are based on family psychopathology due to my background as a psychologist. Right. This book this book kind of veers away from it. I, I like surprises. So I like to surprise myself. And if, if I'm surprising myself, I'm surprising my readers, so. Well, I'm just I guess that's why I don't like to talk about the books too much, you know, because they're, you know, they're just let people discover that. Basically. Well, I just like to say that I'm a seasoned mystery reader. And yeah. I was surprised when I got to the end and surprised in a way that I'm not usually surprised. So. That's the ult from, from you, that is the ultimate compliment. Well, if I can surprise you, I'm a happy camper. You really did, um, for a variety of reasons, which we can't actually discuss, as you know. <laughs> But let's talk about, instead, because we can talk about the victim. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry if we name the actual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. He's dead right there at the very beginning. Exactly. And another hallmark of a really great mystery is that we should mourn the victim. Too often, victims are kind of straw men, or, you know, they turn right. out to really ask for it or right. something. Our victim here is um, is Adonis Clement, and yeah. I think his name is important. Right. He's a he's a sad character, uh, in the sense that he really has good intentions, and yet it catches up up with him. Uh, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it, but. He comes from this strange family. He's got a strange father. He's got a strange mother. And he she called him Adonis. He's indeed very handsome and a very sweet guy. And what he embarks in, he's a photographer. He embarks on a project which he takes homeless people and gets them to talk about their aspirations. Let's say one wants to be a doctor, one wants to be a pilot. And he gets to dress them up and photograph them in these aspirational type of costumes. Now the question is, we won't resolve, is he doing this just to exploit them or does he really care about them or is somewhere in between, but it's dangerous territory. And the homeless situation as, as we know is a big crisis. Um, I'm gonna sound extremely arrogant, but I predicted the homeless crisis in 1972. In 1972, I was a first year grad student or second year grad, grad student PhD clinical psych student. And that was the year that they closed down the mental hospitals. And it was an interesting situation. It started with people like, uh, there's a Scottish psychiatrist named R.D. Lang, who promulgated this nonsense that mentally ill people were really superior to everybody. So they were noble. And then the radical left came in and they said they're, that all Psychiatric patients are political prisoners. I mean, you you remember the 60s and 70s. And then the fiscal conservatives got involved and said, okay, great, it's expensive to keep these hospitals going. Let's close them down. So the whole notion of wholesale closing down mental hospitals, it was helped along by the fact that some of them were terrible places and snake pits, but some of them were not. And in fact, we had a hospital here at Camarillo where the parents were weeping and begging the state not to close the hospital because they had no way to care for their for their mentally ill and mentally retarded, you know, mentally challenged patients. It was very, very sad. And the the theory was that we're going to to substitute for inpatient sale without patient mental health. In other words, little centers around the neighborhood where mentally ill people would come to get their meds and get therapy. And I being a, a young 
naive grad, grad students said, but wait a second, a lot of these people are suffering from a disease which they can't be compliant. They won't show up. It's mm -hmm. not like arthritis. It's a disease that affects the brain. Of course, there are people who denied in those days that it even existed. They're all political prisoners, which is nonsense. And I said, those people are, not, are gonna end up on the street. And that was 1972. I, I, I've subsequently written a column about it uh, for the Wall Street Journal. And I, you know, the only people I got flack from were bureaucrats from the outpatient mental health system. But I think we can see what happened. Now, what's happened was, is what they call a narrative. Now, you notice that writers have narratives and narratives are usually fiction. That word has now been adapted by everybody. I have a narrative because we've lost the line between reality and fantasy, lies and truth. And so the narrative about homeless people, it's occasionally true, has been homeless guy, just a regular guy who falls on some bad luck and loses his job and is all of a sudden out on the street. And therefore the solution is just to help him along, help him get a better job and get him a place to live. And that's still the narrative among most social, socially active people and politicians. But that's not true. That's true in a minority of cases. The most of the homeless people are either severely mentally ill, usually schizophrenic, or drug addicted, or both. And these are people who are incapable of living independently. And just providing housing to them is, is not going to do it. They need care. And then, of course, you get into the whole civil libertarian thing. Eric Adams, the mayor of New York, has started to say, let's increase involuntary holds and put more people in mental hospitals. And the flack he's getting from, from activists, the activists don't really care. They have a cause. The, unlike me, they never saw these people. They never treated these people. I have a friend who's also a well-known writer whose father was severely mentally ill. To the point of being almost homicidal and dangerous. And every time this fellow tried to commit his dad, some lawyer from legal aid would show up who'd never met his dad and fight him. So that's what's happened. Now, I don't like to write a message book, nor am I going to write about that. But I felt, let me at least deal with the homeless in a realistic way. The book's not really only about the homeless, but it certainly features the homeless. And it features the changes in our society that happens when we abandon people, leave them on the streets, defend for themselves when they're in it's, it's the same thing as leaving children out by themselves. Some people are just not capable of living independently. So well, I can't disagree with you. You know, it was a huge problem here. This is the yeah. day after the Super Bowl. And um, Phoenix has a very large homeless camp. Sure. And with um, an anticipation of like 150,000 visitors, in other words, new people clogging mm -hmm. up the city, the question became what to do um, mm -hmm. because it was going to be dangerous. It was going to be dangerous for the homeless people sure. to be overrun. It was going to be possibly dangerous for the people visiting. And, you know, you live in Southern California, which yeah. has a climate that is benign enough. That's the reason. can actually live outdoors. We live in a climate that's maybe six months of the year benign enough. And in the summer, virtually impossible for people to fend for themselves outdoors. Of course. And we, we have a huge problem because of weather. People keep flocking. And if we build more housing, A, it's not going to last. These people are not capable of, of living in housing unsupervised. And there's just have more people come. If you're giving stuff away for free, people will come. It's I, I have compassion. I think I think the people who deal with this on a socio-political level don't have compassion. They're talking about issues rather than people. As a clinician, I used to be a clinician. I, I, I know what it's like. I know how these people live and they're suffering and they're victimized and sometimes they victimize others. Yeah. So I don't want to turn turn this in into a screed, but it is something I, I predict that the homeless crisis in 1972. Well, I think then what you've had to say provides um, the background for the fact that this young man known as Donnie, not Adonis, um, which is his given name, is naive enough to think that he can do this project, this photography project, this wish aspirational project without endangering himself or creating problems for the people that he's inviting in. He comes from staggering wealth. We didn't mention that Victor Clement, the yeah. serial marrying father and serial 
uh, procreating <laughs> um, is one of is is another of these enormous and elusive billionaires. And I have to say, Jen, that the you know the the elusive billionaire or not not elusive but power hungry billionaire, whatever you want to call it, in the, your case, elusive, has really become a feature of a great many crime novels recently. <laughs> I'm serious. Um, yeah. You know, um, the, the Glass Onion, the movie, is sure. going to be Elon Musk. Um, sure. There's a book by Sean W. Little coming out, which is in many ways a replica of sure. the Glass Onion. Again, Elon Musk. Um, and, you know, basically what it's saying is that people with that kind of money, I mean, you know, it's true that the rich are really different, but people with that kind of money are really, really different. Um, yeah. And and so any sort of normal societal strengths, constraints or um, yeah. protocols or anything don't mean anything to them. But it's not just true of of billionaires. Or, I mean, I think the corporate billionaire is a very easy target. Uh, and you know, said Victor defies stereotypes. I right. work really hard to avoid cliches. I don't want to write about Elon Musk. I don't want to write a Romana Clay. That's a lot of bullshit. You know, I want to I want to make stuff up and create interesting characters. And one thing that I notice is, with the exception of some, even even villains, I always develop a compassion for them as I'm writing about them. I always see their humanity. Yeah. Be it the bad guy, I always see something human in there. So they're not cardboard cutouts. They're real people. Be they murderers, victims, in between, relatives. Because I'm interested in people. And as I write the book, these people start talking to me. And I say, hmm, guess what I learned about him? Guess what I learned about her? So I think, I try to avoid the cliche. I think the corporate billionaire is an easy target. But it's not just billionaires and Elon Musk, guys like that. No, And frankly, if Elon Musk was a left winger, nobody would be doing this. But he's a right winger. It's, it's athletes. It's actors, it's movie stars, it's celebrities. When Beyonce had her baby at Lenox Hill, it kicked a whole bunch of other people off the maternity ward. You know, it's anytime somebody's kowtowing to you because they want a piece of your fame or they want to be able to say, I knew that famous person. So, you know, fame could be malignant. I think you're judged. You're not judged by how you treat the people above you. You're, you're really judged by how you treat the people below you. And I try to look at everybody as a human being. If I'm in a restaurant, someone's serving me food, I say, please, I say, thank you. I try to talk to them because they're not robots, they're people. I'm not saying I'm such a perfect guy. I'm sure I make mistakes, but I, to me, I look at the person who's serving me food the same way I look at the president. I, I'm just not impressed by, by any of that. I want to look at humanity in everybody. And that's what I try to do in my books. And that's what I try to do here, even with the homeless. You know, I just gave you a screed on how I felt about it. But that doesn't mean when I'm portraying a homeless person, I don't portray them with sympathy, with humanity. And some are intelligence and some are not. All kinds of people. They are unfortunate. They're, they have an unfortunate situation. I try. I don't believe in ancillary characters. I don't believe in minor characters. I don't believe in Every time you're going to put a person in that book, even if they only appear for a paragraph, my philosophy is they have to matter. It could be a parking attendant. I do not throw people away. And, and it's the way I've written books for 40 years. And, and I think it's people appreciate it. There's a humanism there that they really, really appreciate. So that's what I try to do in all the books, certainly in this book. And you ask why I created this. I, I really never know what I'm doing. I, you know, I just, a book's a year long process. Half of that year is spent planning it. I think I've talked to you about this before. Half, mm -hmm. half, half, half of that year is planning and thinking and outlining. By the time you sit down, kind of think you know what you're doing. Of course you don't because you changed a lot. And that's what I, have, have we ever talked about the right brain and left brain aspect of writing novels? Am I Not going- very much. Go ahead. Okay, so, so you know, there's a whole concept of left brain and right brain. The guy who developed the concept, Robert Ornstein, who was a, a psychologist at Stanford, really regrets creating it because it's bullshit, okay? It's not, that's not the way it works. There's not like, I'm a left brain person, you're a right brain. There's two hemispheres of our brain. They're the theoretically independent of one another, except for a little bunch of nerve fibers connecting them called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is a little bridge and so there's interplay constantly. If you cut that, 
you end up with a person with two separate brains where the right literally doesn't know what the right, what the left is doing. But this whole notion of I'm a left brain person, I'm right brain. So writing novels is the best job in the world because it involves stereotypic left brain stuff, which is, and now I'm left-handed, so I could be anything. I mean, my things could be reversed. Left-handed could be left-right, they could be right-left, they could be mixed, I don't know. But a standard right-handed person, which is 91% of the population, you think of the left brain as the more rational thing. So writing a novel, grammar, spelling, structure, organization, typical left brain mathematical, you know, organizational, right, right brain stuff, creativity, intuitive, making stuff up, fiction. So this wonderful job that I've been so privileged to have combines both constantly. And that's what I find. I have an outline where I think I've been so organized and I know where I'm going and I've written a lot of books. And then once I sit down, it's totally different. It takes over, it has its own thing. And most people who outline, not every writer does, but those who do whom I've spoken to, say the same thing. You finish You finish the book, and you look at your outline, it's a different book. So that's what's so wonderful. There's a, there's a, jo- there's a, a voyage of discovery. Right. And if you're discovering, then your readers are going to discover. And I'm at a point in my life where I don't really care about doing anything but writing the best book possible. That's all I mean. I'm, you know, the money, I have enough money, all that stuff. I want to write the best book possible so it meets my standards. Hopefully, if it meets my standards, other people will appreciate it. And they, they won't, because if you write a series and you write a lot of books, there's always a danger of, of phoning it in. So I work very hard given the confines of the Alex Delaware series to make every book stand on its own and each one being a little different. So that's the challenge. Whether I pull it off, it's not up to me. It's up to other people to say, but that's what I try to do. Well, I'm, you do. And everybody, after all, reads a book differently. So, you know, every yeah. single person who reads the book brings their own left, right brain. A hundred percent. Do it. So it's different. What I was trying to get to with Donnie um, yeah. is that because his father is fabulously wealthy, Donnie, um, who has who has some challenges of his own, yeah. um, does live in a kind of bubble, you know, because he's he he has enough money to... He's not arrogant. He's not, you know, trying to, but he's naive because he hasn't really ever had to face true hardship. A hundred percent. Beautifully put. He's naive. Yeah, no, he is. And, you know, he, he, he really is a sweetheart. There's a very moving thing after he's dead when somebody very close to him talks about what kind of a person he was. And it's just, you know, makes you weep that that we lost him because he was in his own way trying to do a really good thing. But because he's naive, he ventured into this territory that John was earlier talking about, where giving people um, giving people an ask for a bit of hope about maybe their life could be different or they sort of touch wealth and see that life could be different could be really dangerous or you could have nothing whatsoever to do with what happened to that. Exactly. You know, exactly. Um, exactly. but, but I really, I really minded that he died. <laughs> Thank you. Well, anyway, he was, it was sad, but somebody's in a crime novel. Most, mostly people die. They do. And, and I do think that you gave him a really wonderful um, love interest. Um, I won't go into it much, but she is an amazing character too. Um, and I wonder, you know, she's, she fights against so many kind of Hollywood stereotypes and so forth. Was she somebody you expected to be who she is or did she develop as you wrote her? They, they always develop on their own. They develop on their own. I don't even plan it. I, I have the characters, but I never know how, how they're going to develop. He also has this assistant who has a mad crush on him. And one of the things I do in this book, well, I shouldn't give it away. I'm not going to give it away. No. But I try to show Delaware in a different light than just helping to solve crimes. He's still a psychologist, Delaware. He's still juggling two worlds. He's juggling his professional work as a uh, mostly doing child custody work and then called called in to help Milo with cases. But in this book, let's just say at the outset, we see him in a different light. 
Yeah, actually, I thought the whole exercise that he once goes through in the opening pages yeah. of yeah. calming somebody down yeah. Um, yeah. spoke, you know, right from the core of your professional yeah. expertise. And I don't know, my overall sense of the book was that he he was more psychologist than detective. Right. And, right. You know, I mean, obviously, what what is his actual role? Is he just a friend of Milo or is he some kind of consultant to the LAPD? He is not official consultant. What happened is in the first book, when I was writing When the Bow Breaks, I wrote right. it in 81. It wasn't published till 85. I had written several novels that didn't get published. Finally, dumb dummy here figured, write what you know. I had been a psychologist for several years in practice, and I was a medical school professor, and I ran a program for 3,000 kids with cancer at a hospital. So I had a lot of experience. Of course, I never, ever write about a patient, ever. And so I bent over backwards not to do that, which made me a better writer because we make stuff up. But I decided I had been involved in some pretty nasty child abuse cases as a consultant. And I thought I could integrate some of that into this plot. But I don't like amateur detective novels. I like Philo Vance. I mean, I mean, I just don't like this nonsense where the amateur comes up and shows up the dumb cops. It doesn't work that way. So I said, okay, I have to have a cop. I have to have a cop. And it's LA, so he has to be a homicide cop. And I said, well, let me make him gay because I was doing everything to fight cliches. I felt books, crime novels were so cliche written. So for example, I have Alex and Robin, his, his lover, his girlfriend. She, I said, I'm gonna create a couple where the male deals with human feelings and emotion and the female deals with power tools. So <laughs> from the outset, she builds guitars, she has sauce, she has bands. From the outset, there was an attempt to really do it differently. So what happens was Alex and Milo become friends in this case. And it's, it's an evolving relationship because Milo happens to be the cop on this case that Alex gets involved in. And then they develop this relationship, this uh, straight man and a gay man. And I was just did an interview with a writer who's a gay writer and he's talking about, and he's a young guy. He, he was talking about the fact that Milo is still his favorite gay character ever. And he, he's a young guy. I mean, he probably wasn't even alive when the books were, uh, were started, but he quotes in this interview, the original book where Alex is coming to grip. He's slightly homophobic. He, he's a little uncomfortable with it. So it's an evolving process and they develop. So they become friends. And Milo sees this guy's a genius. The thing about Delaware, he's in a sense a Sherlockian character. What sets him apart is not profiling, which is, again is a lot of nonsense. It is his powers of observation, his ability to see things in detail. Not in the gimmicky way you see in Sherlock Holmes of he tells you what cigar you smoke, but on a psychological level of looking at people, looking at behavior without necessarily analyzing them. So they become friends, and after a while, Milo keeps calling him him in. The the department in one of the books I forget offers him a consultant job. They want to hire him because he's really helpful, and he turns the police chief down for two reasons. First of all, it's too confining. He doesn't want to be an employee of LEPD. He wants to be an independent guy. Second of all, the money sucks. You know, so he's making a lot of money doing custody evaluations. I mean, custody evaluations now. They're getting forty, fifty to two hundred thousand dollars in evaluation in the high end. If he, you know, so he's Alex is he makes enough money doing evaluations and other friends at work, which which I did too. So I, you know, I know I've been in court many, many times as an expert witness. So he makes enough money doing that part time that he can basically donate his services to his best friend. And, and there's always jokes about Milo saying, I'll send the bill in, but you know, it's gonna take forever to pay and they won't pay and he doesn't really care. So it's just his way of dealing with it, with this nasty world that pro provides a little bit of balance to his conventional money-making, life-sustaining, normal job as a psychologist. Well, that's very true. But you know, you also then solve a problem, which is that right. somebody who's not actually paid to be in law enforcement, how right. does he have enough leisure time? And how exactly. does he, you know, have enough money where he can donate his leisure yeah. time? And um, and he's a guy who lives well, but he doesn't live 
in a crazy way, you know, he and his wife, he and his girlfriend have a nice house. She makes a good income. He makes a good, he bought the house years ago. I also mentioned in that first novel, he made some investments. So he's, he's a fairly well-heeled guy and he, you know, he lives nicely, but he doesn't, he still drives the same car that he's got a third engine in it because he's a very loyal person. He's not out like me buying a bunch of cars, you know? So, so he can easily support his lifestyle uh, with 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 consulting work, and uh, that frees them up to do the other stuff. And it does, you know. In in many of the golden age detective novels, we found clerical sleuths. They could be rabbis. They could yeah, be priests. sure. And in part, that solved this problem we were just talking about. That these were people who had a place to live and a salary and enough exactly. free time where they could, you know, go off. It's sort of Lord Peter Wimsey. I mean, the same thing. Yeah. You know, I'm very. Very much so. But it also means that Robin, who's a luthier, we talked earlier about Jen's yeah. guitar collection. Um, yeah. You know, she's successful at it, but she doesn't really have to be successful at yeah. it. So she, successful can, she can indulge herself. You have a really nice scene in the book where she's acquired some amazing seasoned wood from somebody and she's right. you know, deciding how to use it. And in fact, I'm going to digress for a moment before I come back, because there are, uh, there's at least one other place where John's own personal stuff comes into play. Um, <laughs> You're exposing me. <laughs> I am. Aside from food trucks, uh, where is the bit about the fish? I know I oh, know. Yeah, because John has this wonderful um, koi pond on in yes. one of his properties, and yeah. you um, you gave us a chance to visit the koi pond in this book, or a koi pond anyway. Yeah, well, we've had uh, I had the fish before I wrote the books. I've always <laughs> loved fish and animals. Faye and I are big animal people. It, we're not. We raised four four kids. Our fifth child, who doesn't talk back, is our dog, and uh, we have koi. We have a turtle pond. We have birds. Uh, we just love animals. And uh, especially during COVID, we found it very comforting. So I've had some of these koi for 40 years. You know, they- Yeah, I mean, no, they're gorgeous, but I love gorgeous. seeing them in the- We pool. coddle them. <laughs> oh, and we, and we have a saltwater aquarium too. So we have a, we have a lot, of, lot of animals, one dog only, but there have been times in our life when we had three, which was a little crazy. <laughs> It is a little crazy. We currently have three. Two of them are siblings um, and quite young. I took Scooter to his first ever book of it a week ago, <laughs> Monday night. Yeah. James Rollins is, you know, a veterinarian as well as a as a thriller writer. And um, he said to me he really didn't care if Scooter misbehaved because, you know, <laughs> like messy stuff with dogs. And I have to say my puppy was incredibly good. But oh, Well, I'll tell you, when we did it, it was 92. We had just moved into this house. We had a new baby. And we were foolish enough to, have, to buy a third dog. And we had the most strange mix of dogs. We had a Papillon who weighed seven pounds. We had a French Bulldog who weighed about 27. And then we had a 150-pound Cane Corso, which is a Sicilian Mastiff. Because I just thought, God, it'd be great to have a huge dog. And her name was Donna. She looks like the biggest blue and gold Rottweiler you've ever seen. She's an attached Sicilian Mastiff. They they call them cane corsos for some reason, which is so stupid. It's cane. It's 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 Latin right. cane Latin, corso. Right. But I, it just grits my teeth when I hear people say cane corso because it's C A N E. But anyway, she only lived nine nine years and she died in my arms. It was a very traumatic event oh. for me. So I decided to just just keep it at one dog at this point. Big dogs don't live as long as small she didn't. dogs. She died time. in my arms. She waited for me. And awful. She oh. looked me in the eye, took three gasps and died. She waited for me to be there. Uh, she had congestive heart failure for a couple of weeks. Oh. And, and uh, she's a sweet, sweet dog, but very protective. You know, they're very, very protective dog. And people would say, can I pet her? I said, no, <laughs> you can't. But we had teenage girls at that point. Yeah. So it was really great because the boys would come over and Donna would be sitting in the entry hall and the boys would come in and she'd go, mm -hmm. so I knew that <laughs> everything was going to be fine. I love it. I'm trying to find, there was one other thing that I thought that I had marked, but anyway, at some point somewhere in this book, John touches on um, a thing in my life, which um, I was so surprised. One of the characters for some reason or other either comes from or is in Ames, 
Iowa. Who knows what? Right. And I was I read it because I went blink. My father grew up in oh, Ames, really? Iowa. He wow. was the captain of the football team. He, wow. uh, you know, and I thought I I I don't ever think I seen Ames, Iowa featured in a in a book. I'm very fond of the Midwest. Okay. The Midwest gave me my wife. Aha. Uh-huh. And I really respect people from the Midwest. My mother in law is from the Midwest. Uh, Faye's gra- grandfather fought for America in World War I. Wow. Uh, they're from St. Louis, Missouri. And so I, I, I really think there's a tendency on the part of writers and movie makers to just disparage the whole center of the country as if it's okay. nothing but coasts. And I just always want to feature all parts of the country. And even though I'm an LA writer, which is by luck, because I grew up here, I moved here when I was nine. Uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence some of the best crime novels have been set here because Southern California is a third world nation full of, full of tension. You know, I've, I've always talked about the disparities between the haves and the have nots. So, and also I think what's really changed about LA, when we moved in 59, there was a film business, but it wasn't a company town. Aerospace was really big. There were all kinds of ways you could make a living. My dad was in aerospace. So a lot of engineers and really rock solid people. Now LA is totally entertainment. I mean, it's just a company town. And you're talking about businesses that truck in fantasy. So, you know, so I mean, come on, that's that's really ripe for all kinds of bad things happening. So, Very true. Although I guess the mouse house in Florida is in trouble. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, but they're just an extension of L.A. You know? well, they are. They're, you they're, know what? When I was a freshman at Stanford, we played, yeah. um, was it UCLA or SoCal? I can't remember a football game. Yeah. So, you know, little freshman, we all trundled down there because it was an exciting and wonderful yeah. thing to do. Yeah. And guess what? We went to Anaheim when it was all orange groves and no concrete. Exactly. And we went to Disneyland when it was essentially brand new. Yeah. And Knott's Berry Farm was there. Yeah. yeah. And people were still wondering, you know, it was a little crazy. Would it even survive? Um, you know, so I'm fascinated to see how yeah. it's become, an, uh, you know, the mouse has become um, the king of an empire all over. Well, really. you know, but but this whole thing about the film business dominating the city Elmer Leonard, Dutch, Dutch was great writer. And I loved him. And, you know, Get Shorty. No. You're familiar with that book. But the premise of that book, if you have this guy, Chili, who's a bone breaker for the mob in Florida, he beats people up for a living. He's a bad guy, right? And, so, and he comes out to L.A. and he's absolutely horrified by the terrible people he meets in the film business. And I think that was Dutch's way, because for a long time, his books didn't make any money. And he made his money writing screenplays. And, and I think he would just want to talk about all those people. Not say everyone in the film business is a bad person, but there's so much lying and cheating and entitlement. And it's something I've never wanted to be a part of, ever, even when I won the Golden Award. I wanted to write books. I have no, no interest in writing for film or, or doing any of that. So you know how we ended up in LA, my family and I? It was very sad. My dad was a World War II hero. He was in Battle of Bulge, D-Day Normandy, came back to New York. My mom grew up in the slums of the Lower East Side. Here, here, here's, here's my mom who just passed at nearly 103, who was a four pound preemie baby who they stuck in a dresser drawer for an incubator. People were tough in those days. Anyway, my dad comes home and, they, and there's no housing. The GI Bill just wasn't working. So my parents were in a series of slums one room slums. My mom said in some of them, you could put a bottle and it would roll, roll down. And I was born in 49. I was the oldest. And I, and my mom said I shared a room with them. Then when I was about two or three, we moved to the projects in Long Island City, the Ravenswood Home Projects, which are now, I think, considered the ninth most dangerous place in New York City. But in those days, it was a decent place. And finally, my parents, neither of whom had ever lived in a house, bought this tiny little eight, 900 square foot place in Queens, in Bayside, Queens. And my dad was a handy guy. He could build patios and screened in porches, a tiny little place. It was on a block of identical homes, uh, like tract homes. And I used to go to the wrong house and the neighbor would bring, would bring me home. Anyway, they condemned it for the Clearview Expressway. 
make the so my so my dad says to hell with this move to California. So that's why we spontaneously in the middle of the year in January, we moved to LA with no plans and no housing and a budget of 35 bucks a week. And we lived in a motel because nobody would rent to a family with three kids. And I remember the motel, the ranch hotel on Pico, kind of where Fox Studio is now. It had like a cactus neon sign and a cowboy and it had a swimming pool, which is awesome. Finally, they they got a little apartment, but Ellie was different in those days. Ellie was oh, I knew it was. It you was, know, when was, I came to visit you and drove down Wilshire, I could hardly, I mean, I yeah. last saw Wilshire Boulevard in like 1959 or something. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. believe it. It's just a long glass canyon. L.A. used to be a place where if a, if you stepped off a curb, a car would stop for you if you're a pedestrian. And we were amazed by that coming from New York City. <laughs> you know, where they don't do that. Now it's not true. It's yeah. just not true. People are not nice. They will flip you off and they will not, even if you have the right of way, something happened to the city that made it meaner. I'm not sure what it is. Well, I worry about Phoenix and Scottsdale. It didn't help. The Super Bowl probably brought even more people in. But you know, I'm from the Midwest, <laughs> yeah. John. I'm from yeah. you know, I was born in Winnipeg, which is and, part of Chicago, so oh, yeah. of suburb. And for a long, long time here in Phoenix and in Scottsdale, huge numbers of people were from the Midwest who came for the winter. They came from Minnesota. They came from <laughs> Easterners tended to go to Florida. Midwesters right. came to Arizona. But you know, all of that is really changing. And I mean, you, you, there were a lot of Midwestern values here. And now I see that it's becoming much more like Southern California. It really well, is. I, there's still a lot of good in Southern California. It's very easy to criticize it. And we talk about that, but there's still a lot of lovely people. And there's still a lot of, people are still nice. I, I'm one of those naive guys who really believes most people are good. I mean, and the research is, is bearing it out. There's this whole notion that kids were a blank slate, tabula rasa. There's a wonderful thing called Babies on Netflix. Wait, they do. The, it's actually based on research, and they show that even little babies at a young age are altruistic. And That's wonderful. It's, it's wonderful that. to see. Yeah, I mean, I, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Now I was going to change the subject. Yeah, go ahead. You're done. Okay. So there are moments where John's background in psychiatry, psychology really come into play in this book. And one of them is um, when Milo and Alex are having a conversation about, you know, Donnie had this project with these homeless people. And so are they suspects in his death, whatever? And Milo says, now all I have to do is find eight homeless people. Excuse <laughs> me unhomed individuals. <laughs> You're the social scientist. Tell me why people think remaining anything makes a difference. And Alex says, it's easier than finding a real solution. Yeah. Just call it something different. This is, a, this is a pet peeve of mine. We change things. We just change the names of things as if that's going to make a difference. And it, it rarely, if ever, does. And it is a way of avoiding because most things that are effective involve hard work, hard work. And so people want to have a magic wand. We'll rename it. It'll be treated differently. So, right. you know, it, what, what's, what's the difference whether you call them unhomed or homeless? What's the difference? What is the difference? They still have a big problem. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I'll give you a good example. Psychopath. Psychopath is a term that, you know, goes back to uh, a book called The Mask of Sanity written in, in, in the 30s by a psychiatrist named Cleckley, psychopath. And it was basically, we know what a psychopath, I mean, a lot of people don't, but it's, you know, but it's a, they're bad people. It's not a mental illness. It's a personality quirk where they don't have empathy and they can be cruel, blah, blah, blah. Then politically people said, well, you know, society, so let's call them sociopaths. Well, it's the same thing. And, and yet you'll have ignorant people trying to differentiate psychopath versus sociopath. It's the same thing. We just renamed it. Now the American Psychiatric Association calls them antisocial personality. And they, we keep renaming it, but it's the same thing. I like psychopath. And I, and I stick with it. And because the, the guy who knows more about it is a psychologist named Robert Hare. And he calls them psychopaths. So, you know, I, we just rename things. I... I we do. No, there's no question about it. So Donnie, um, who 
aspiration. He's a photographer and he, yeah. you know, aspires to be better known, do good work, the whole bit, even he has all this money, but somehow maybe 10 years ago, he had sort of a successful show. So he's grasping for some project that he can do that will be significant. Um, and the thing we've mentioned to him is, is he's decided that um, he's going to, um, and Alex and, and um, Milo stumble upon photographs at the crime scene, which reveal these people who've been dressed up and made up and turned into, and what he calls them, um, a name typed in capitals had been affixed to the top of each before shot. In other words, the, the unhomed individual that was brought in for this project. Each aftershot was tagged with a single sentence wish summary. Right. So part of what Donnie did was to try to figure out what these people would like to be yeah. if everything had gone their way. Did they want to be a surgeon? Did they want to be a ballerina? Did they right. want whatever? And that's, of course, where, you know, he, he was naive in thinking that there wasn't danger and even unkindness, I think. In, I, I, I think his intentions are his intentions are pure. They are. Intentions are pure, but he just is, as you say, he's a babe in the woods to some extent. But um, <laughs> this 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 tendency to, you know, to to rename things, I, I'm going back to these uh, Idaho murders, you know, and uh, I wrote a book called Savage Spawn, which is a nonfiction book about violent kids back in the 90s at the invitation of uh, Random House, a library of contemporary thought. And there's a section in there called, what I call them schizoid psy psychopaths. And I use the Unabomber as an example. And it's basically a psychopath who went, because some psychopaths are very charming. They're very charismatic. A lot of politicians, I won't name name names, but yes. ch charisma is, is one, one of these days I'm gonna write a book called Charisma because charisma is really malignant, okay? It's very superficial. But, but they're very charming and some of them, and in fact, the more intelligent the psychopath, the less likely they are to use violence because violence is a very ineffective mechanism for getting what you want. But there's a, then there's what we used to call schizoids. Schizoids are loners, people who can't relate to other people. And um, then there's a schizoid psychopath. So it's like the Unabomber. He likes to sit in a cabin by himself and just kill people for the fun of it. And when I heard about these Idaho murders, I don't, I'm not going to pontificate about, about a guy I've never met, but some of what I'm hearing about Comeyer is starting to evoke that in me. You know, a guy who really had trouble relating to people, but is also cruel and callous. Now, maybe he's innocent, I won't say anything, but that's the chord it struck with me. So, yes, we'll now, I feel the same way, actually, reading about him. I, yeah. I the minute that he was actually enrolled in whatever the course he was taking, uh, that's it. This is, yeah. this is the guy. So relating to what we were talking yeah. about names, when trying to get to grips with one character in the book, <clears throat> you say, when it came to blank, the internet did what it always does when facts are lacking, substituted random guesswork, borderline libel, and paranoid nonsense. And again, I think you are so right that, that you know, everybody has a platform now. It, did, it used to be that a lot of these people were muzzled or their range was like one other person. But now, you know, and so rather than trying to, the, the lack of, you know, daily newspapers, the lack of investigative reporting that is edited and responsible, we get all this wacko stuff all the time. Yeah. Again, it's just, it's applying terms. I beautifully put, I mean, the, the, it's, it's led to the degradation of our political dialogue. Mm -hmm. Most people are not extremists. Most people are not extreme. If you speak to, to most people and they're kind of close together, you know, e e even if you look at politics in America in the 80s, Republicans and Democrats, there wasn't that much separating them. Now, because of the internet, as you say, if you were... A, if you wanted to pontificate, you had to take a soapbox and go in the park and scream and yell. Nobody would hear you anyway. Now, every crazy person, every idiot, every psychopath can get on the Internet and spout stuff and a million people are going to follow. And the news cycle has changed from 24 hours to 24 seconds. It's all clickbait. 
Well, yeah. it is clickbait, unfortunately, and I don't care how many yeah. algorithms they yeah. devise, all yeah. of this stuff leaks out all the time. And then you Absolutely. have somebody like Elon Musk, who we've mentioned again, who thinks, <laughs> you know, that just letting it all run out there is better for everybody. I'm on even yeah. but, okay, but, but, so, but the thing, yeah, but the thing is that because of because of the clickbait thing, the so-called conventional papers are now imitating that. Yeah. And so their standards of journalism have fallen too. So it's it's really pretty sad what's happened. It really is. And unfortunately, the crazier people get all the attention. Kari Lake yeah. here, Donald Trump in Florida, you know, because they are super yeah. clickbait, you yeah. know, they keep getting. So let's talk one more example of Alex's training come in, comes in yeah. very early in the book when somebody <laughs> is having a meltdown. Um, and I really love the way you sort of sum it up. Um, when you say she was ready to wind down, seriously, Alex, what, what feels bad about anxiety is loss of control. Anything that restores control can help. So you gave her permission to freak out. I didn't figure it, fight it, or order her to relax. Sounds like reverse psych to me. If I had tried it, the whole damn thing would probably help. <laughs> and then you mentioned that an aftermath of an adrenaline OD is that people hit a fatigue wall soon, and that is a good time to question them. But I, I like the whole sequence that Alex and this woman who has discovered the body and is totally freaking out, how he brings her back in ways that I think that most of us wouldn't think of, that we would have, in fact, done the wrong thing rather than you know tell her to relax right no it's substitute she needed to hear no substitute for clinical experience you know yeah. i just i dealt with it for years what's the worst thing anyone wants to hear when they're tense relax you know you'll hear the cops do that 911 why they do you need to calm down sir you need right. to, that's the last thing people want to hear they're upset for a reason but we we keep doing it to make ourselves feel better because we are not happy when someone else is anxious. Yeah, no, it's our coping mechanism. It's like a baby crying. We want the baby to shut up and go to Absolutely. sleep. Absolutely. But so, it's our coping mechanism. Exactly. It's, it's, it's all selfish. Crazy. It's all selfish. Yeah. It, it really annoys that. me when I hear that. Someone say, you need to calm down. <laughs> That's not going to calm somebody. Well, if for nothing else, if you read this book, it will give you instant <laughs> instruction on how to deal with somebody having a meltdown. Yeah, it's true. The final thing I've said that we would come back and talk about Culver City. And yeah. here's what John has to say. <laughs> Lots of traffic, the new Culver City. During Prohibition days, the town had been a corrupt oasis for bootleggers, with local cops notifying the criminals in advance of raids. Four decades later, the town settled in as a sleepy adjunct to the southernmost tip of West LA. Now it was hipster central housing cruel-looking knife-edge buildings that clog the business district from <laughs> Venice Boulevard to Jefferson, home bases for streaming services, software giants, game developers, and the kind of startups that hatch 19-year-old moguls. All that <laughs> also brought the enterprises that sprouted on islands of youthful affluence, gourmet food trucks, bars pretending to be dives. I love that one. Yeah. The latest thing cafes. <laughs> Mandatory nods to organic, vegan, sustainable, and other <laughs> any other trendoid deemed virtuous. And I thought, you know, didn't Raymond Chandler write about Culver City? He or, sure did. And he you know, sure it did. was, if I remember right, you know, it was indeed that place you first mentioned. And now, 100 percent now Only it's corrupt. Hipster central. It's changed. I mean, it was so corrupt. Everything that you just read is true. And but for years, Culver City was this kind of this conservative, blue collar, white collar, little bedroom community that nothing ever happened. And then because land was a lot cheaper than, than in West LA, Google moved there and Apple moved there. They're all there. They've changed it totally. But they get involved in crazy things. For example, we go back to the homeless. They had a lot of homeless people living on the sidewalks in Culver City, right? blocking the sidewalk so people couldn't walk. So what's their solution? I don't know whether they're actually doing it, but their proposal was to spend a whole lot of money widening the sidewalk, like a huge amount of money to widen the sidewalk. 
what need I say more? <laughs> yeah. no, not at all. But you also mentioned the fact that parks that used to be, you know, places where yeah. kids could play and people yeah. could enjoy are now are now camps, you know, for yeah. for the homeless. And that also has changed the city. Let's call Patrick in. He has managed to um stay stay with us here when he should have come into this conversation a long time back. Patrick, I'm sorry. Come and join us and I'm gonna shut up and you take over. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> I take over. I'll, I'll just want to talk about guitars, but <laughs> no. Um, we've got some good questions that have come in. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, Pat says, uh, kind of going back to what you were talking about, charisma, and what an interesting, compelling topic that would be. Would that be a, a possible title of a book? for? It might be. It, I, I, it, I might have time to do it because I think it's a very negative thing because it's superficial by nature. And it can be used in a very bad way. Right. Let's see here. Um, there was a question here. Okay, uh, uh, Daniel uh, wants to know, uh, your, your background is in child psychology, as is Alex. Uh, is Milo's character based upon anyone you have known in the past? Uh, as a fan, I should probably know this. No. <laughs> whole cloth. I can't tell you when the books first came out, how many people came out and said, I know who that's based on. I totally, like everyone else, I invent them in my head. I, I really, because I was a psychologist and I was so restricted by confidentiality, it forced me just to, and first of all, that's the fun of writing fiction. People don't understand that we people who write fiction, I've talked to Dean Kuntz about this and Stephen King, we just love making stuff up. <laughs> so no, no, he's out of whole cloth. Um, let's see, uh, Robin says, uh, tuning in a bit late, uh, the brain is phenomenal and there's still so much to learn. Um, yes. Reading books out of my comfort pleasure zone allows for growth. Uh, has Jonathan mentioned, uh, let's see, which writers were an early inspiration for him? Oh boy, I mean, I used to, I read adult books as a child. So Dumas and all the adventure stuff, and Robert Louis Stevenson and James T. Farrell, who people may not know, Studs who was a writer. Lonnie. He's Studs Lonegan. I My parents happened to have one of his books in the house and they left me alone. And at the age of nine, I discovered and I read stuff that was totally inappropriate. I just thought he was an amazing writer, uh, but I, I was eclectic. And in terms of crime fiction, I'm very much a fan of, of Sherlock Holmes in that sense, because I like the use of observation. Uh, I do like the hardball detectives. I prefer Ross McDonald to Chandler. And a lot of the lesser known guys, I think Ray Jonathan Latimer, Horace Poy. I think Chandler's overrated. I think Dashiell Hammett's overrated. It's not my cup of tea, but I love Ross McDonald. I thought he was great. As James Elroy, and I used to call him Ross the Boss. So, so he's good. Now, uh, the, the, the person I really admire is, is Ruth Rendell, even though we write nothing alike, but we both deal with human psychology. And I think she was one of the great writers of the 20th, early 21st century. I like that you mentioned Horace McCoy. He's a really Yeah, good, they shoot horses. Yeah, yeah they, all those lesser known guys are great. Yeah, Jonathan Latimer, I mean, all, all those guys are great. David Goodis, all the hard boiled stuff. But uh, Ross, I would say of all them, Ross, Ross McDonald and, and Margaret and Margaret Millar to some extent, really, they were Southern California writers and they really helped me create my own books. Wow. Although interestingly enough, they were Canadian. Uh, yes, they were Canadian, but they moved to Santa yeah, Barbara. Yeah, they, they called Santa, 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 Santa Teresa. Here, but... Yeah, well, I, I'm originally from New York City. No one's from here, so, except my kids they are all California. Let's see here. Um... Okay, Daniel Daniel would like to know, um, okay, COVID put a stop to the signing book tours of America's favorite yeah. authors. That's true yeah. for a while. Uh, now that COVID has finally begun to decline, do you ever see yourself going out on the road again? I never say never. Uh, it actually, for us, it wasn't COVID. It was Jeff Bezos who basically destroyed the book business because it's eBooks, you know, and you can't tour for, for an eBook. Uh, Barbara's the exception. She runs a great bookstore. Most of, most of the bookstores close. There's nowhere to browse. There's nothing to do. And publishers don't just don't want to spend the money to tour you. I did many, many years of touring 
So I think my touring days are probably over, but I never say never. I keep hoping we'll hook him over here just <laughs> one more time. Maybe with Jesse. That's why I was so hopeful it was going to be August. Well, you maybe know? a year from August. We'll maybe see. a year from August, because they are. We've had the entire Kellerman family here, yeah, um, more than once. But we've had Jonathan and Jesse. We've had Jonathan and Faith. But I love Jonathan and Jesse together. They have this wonderful right. father son. Yeah. Actually, um, Jonathan and I became friends. I think partly because we supported Jesse, who's just a oh. wonderful writer. It could be true, yeah. yeah he's, no, I he's, think it is true. He's he's brilliant. He's brilliant. He's dealing with five children now. So, you know. And his wife is a doctor, so they actually did know how but that happens, John. Come on. She is a doctor who didn't practice medicine. She's an executive of a healthcare company. She has a new book out. She has a business book out called Tomorrowland, Good which God. she wrote. Yeah, yeah. She has a book. Another Kellerman wrote. Gab Gabriella Rosen Kellerman, Tomorrowland. Came on July. Yeah. Let's see here. Um, okay, uh, Karen. Karen says, hello from Kansas. Uh, hello. Do you and Faye ever help each other when you get in a corner as you write? Neither of us ever get into a corner. We've never blocked. The one time that was relevant, we did two novellas together, two, two sets of, of two, four, four, four novellas, Capital Crime and Double, Double Homicide. In that sense, we really liked it because, as Faye said, you know, I would do a draft that I'd have to worry about. I'd send it to him via, via email and then I'd send it back. So in that sense, but we, we don't block. I, I've never had writer's block. And I think the reason I've never had writer's block, neither has, has Faye, to my knowledge, is because I spend so much time planning and plotting. Uh, now, that doesn't mean I don't write crap on various days, but hopefully I rewrite it. My favorite quote about writer's block was, was Robert Parker, the late grade. He said, well, Mr. Vargo, what do you think about writer's block? He says, when you call a plumber, does he say, I can't come because I have plumber's block? I love that. <laughs> so we treat it like a job. And uh, no, and, you know, it's really funny because people would always interview Jesse when he was a kid and say, what was it like with two writer? He says, you're under the impression we sit around the table talking about books. We don't. We talk about what all families talk, talk about. We were a very child-oriented family. We focus on the kids. So it was a boringly normal child <laughs> so Faye and i don't really talk about our books much we just do our job you know do you have similar writing habits i mean are you in opposite sides of the house and yes yes opposite sides of, yeah she has her own office i have my own office it's a fairly large house so it's You're separated by morning, morning writers or? i mean i'm not rigid about it back in my failed failed writer days and during the first five bestsellers when i was in practice i used to write from 11 p.m to 1 a.m in my garage but given the choice, I prefer the morning. But once again, if I don't get to it in the morning, I'm a little more free and easy now. I'm not, I'm not that rigid. But I, I do prefer the morning because we're fresher. You know. I think that's about it. But for my own edification, yes. I mean, are you still acquiring any new instruments? I know you were playing the oud last time. I, I do play the oud. My philosophy about I have enough instruments. I'm not a hoarder. I want it to look good. So my philosophy is nothing comes in unless something goes out. Ooh. So so I did purchase a historically important guitar. I, I mostly play classical guitar. I read music, I play classical guitar. And I purpose I purchased a really nice historically important one and put another one up for sale because, you know, I don't want it anymore. I, I'm at the point in my life where I feel like paring down a bit, but I'm too lazy to do it basically. Yeah. I sold a bunch of cars, you know, I, you, you just have enough stuff after a while. So, you know. I'm mostly concentrating on playing music rather than acquiring instruments. I can see what looks like some nice national resonators yeah. over there. Yeah, it's my collection of nationals there. Nice. I have them here because you, they don't need humidification because they're made out of metal. Right. Hmm? Yes. Still good. That was my beautiful wife <laughs> telling me to come for dinner. So, I, yeah. I think I think that means we probably have talked long enough, but it's always so much fun. And I never know our conversations yeah. with John it's great. Rory, which it's makes great. it even more fun. It's great but, to see you. Next time you're in L.A., you got to come by. Well, again. I'll talk to you about Passover. We've talked about that before. Oh, I told you great. that once in my life, I think that I and my my wonderful Jewish husband should experience Passover. So Maybe we'll do that this year. I think it would be fun. 
it would be fun. We'll talk okay. about it. All right. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for watching us. Um, um, this will become a podcast and the video here on Facebook and on YouTube will stay up forever. So if you know anyone that has uh, couldn't join us now, but would like to watch it, they're certainly welcome to. John has signed copies of the book. Hold up the book. You still got the book? There it is. <laughs> Our copies should be with us any moment, actually. I thought yes, they were today. Um, and they officially go on sale tomorrow. So perhaps that is the day that we will have them. But uh, do grab one before we sell out. Have a happy Valentine's Day, everybody. You too, Barbara. You and your Thank beautiful you. wife. And Patrick, yours isn't going to start well, but I hope it ends well. <laughs> <laughs> it's great yeah. to see you.